I'm Helen Papuni from the College of Work-Based Learning and it's my privilege to open proceedings tonight with a karakia. Te a karakia tātou. Tu koe te wairua ki a rere ki ngā taumata, he a rahi a tātou mai. Me tā tātou whai ngā tika ngā rātou mā, ki a mō, ki a ita, ki a kore a e nā rō, ki a pupuri, ki a whakamau ai, ki a tīna, tīna, kui e, tāe ki e. Tēnā koe e, Joe. Thank you, Helen. I am Leone Schmidt, and I am the Director of Research and Postgraduate Studies at Otago Polytechnic. Now, my hare mai, welcome to all in this room and online at this very special event, Professor Jo Kirkwood's inaugural prof professorial lecture. Her topic, Tall Poppy Syndrome, makes me smile, as she herself is a tall poppy as are all the kaimahi who have been promoted to the professoriate Takahui Ahurangi across the network. We are here tonight to be informed about Jo's trajectory towards her promotion. Inaugural professorial lectures also function as opportunities for the public and the professor's community of practice to be afforded the opportunity to understand the context and content of the promotion. It is a high bar, and I congratulate Professor Kirkwood on achieving her promotion. We are here to celebrate with her and her whanau and this, on this auspicious day of the Professorial Practice Symposium. I meet Jo in the context of the Doctorate of Professional Practice. We negotiated the early days of the first final assessment together. She was thorough, calm under pressure, collegial, a real pleasure to work with. Jo's lovely smile and ready laugh make everything easier and fun. We are looking forward to your lecture, Jo. And a big thank you to Leslie Brooke and Rina Chan for organizing this event. I am now handing over to Beth Rose, who will introduce you, Jo. Support. There we go. <clears> Tena <throat> Tenakoto, Tena Tena Katua. Warm greetings from Rakiura, Stewart Island, although it's not so warm here. Um, my name is Beth Rose, and I'm a research chair professor of business policy and strategy at the Indian Institute of Management, Udaipur, and a very proud friend of today's honoree. I am delighted and truly honored to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Joe Kirkwood on this wonderful occasion. An inaugural professorial lecture is truly a landmark event in an academic career, and I could not be happier to be able to be part of Joe's big day. Professor Joe Kirkwood is quite simply one of the finest people I have met in my very very long time in academia. She's a kind and caring colleague who often to the detriment of her own workload, never hesitates to jump in and do what it takes to get the job done. Seriously, you have how rare that is in academic circles. Joe's strengths extend to all aspects of an academic's responsibility. She's an excellent teacher and an absolutely outstanding mentor for young researchers. I've had the pleasure of co-supervising several doctoral students with Jo, and she is just amazing. She's much too good at service for her own good. She's an effective and efficient administrator, also a rarity among academics. All of this dedication to helping others takes time away from research. 
There are, after all, only 24 hours in a day, and Joe is also a dedicated mom, partner, daughter, and friend. But here's the thing. Joe also does fascinating research, some of which we're, we will hear about in just a few minutes, pretty much as soon as I stop talking. Her work is all strongly embedded in her core focus on entrepreneurship, while reaching out to consider a variety of interesting questions and issues. What has always really impressed me about Joe's research is that she does work that matters to real people and businesses. I definitely cannot make the same claim about my own research. She manages to do research that contributes to our fundamental understanding of phenomena while always making the connection to real life the work that she will discuss today on tall poppy syndrome is just one example. She has also done work on mumpreneurs and echopreneurs, and these are categories of entrepreneurs that are increasingly important to national economies around the world, especially in our hopefully post-COVID environment. And Joe has literally been writing about them for years. She has looked at how entrepreneurs are created and nurtured, considering the family environment, looking at both parents and spouses. Most of the entrepreneurship literature pretty much assumes that the founder of a business is inherently an entrepreneur. The entrepreneurial bent is kind of taken as a given, and the entrepreneur essentially just springs up out of nowhere. Joe's work takes a big and important step back to try and understand how and under what conditions a person might develop into an entrepreneur. She has also done work on entrepreneurial education and training. Taken as a whole, she provides evidence that entrepreneurs are not simply born that way, but that they can be created and at various stages of their lives. That's really important stuff. In the process, Joe has made important contributions to the literature on gender in business. Just recently, one of her papers with Brendan, from whom we'll hear later, was listed on the top 20 reading list for gender and sustainability. This list was compiled by the Women of the Academy of International Business. This is actually a big deal. Joe does not engage actively with the international business academic community. It's not her research area. So this recognition means that her work crosses notoriously non-porous academic boundaries, something few of us can really claim. Entrepreneurship, sustainability, gender. Talk about research that matters to New Zealand and beyond. So please join me in congratulating Jo and recognizing her family, especially Doug, Finn, and Connor. None of this happens in a vacuum. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the woman of the hour, Professor Jo Kirkwood. I really love hearing that title with your name, Jo. She's, she's going to share her thoughts on whether or not tall poppy syndrome is holding New Zealand back. Jo, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Beth. That sounds, um, sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. It's um, it's great to be here. It's uh, I'm a bit nervous about it actually. It's um, yeah, it's a big big thing which has taken a long time to get here. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the journey and then tell you about um, tall poppy syndrome and what I've recently been working on uh, with Rod McNaughton. So thanks for coming, everyone. And I'll see if I can work Leslie's computer. Right, so where did I where did I come from? So I guess I um, I finished my masters and moved to Wellington and started a, a career in um, the government and didn't last there too long before I moved overseas. And then while I was overseas, I decided I needed to do a PhD. And at that time, I can really uh, only think of the reasons of why I was I was wanting to do a PhD was because I thought it would be nice for people to call me doctor. And I also thought that I might get upgrades if I went on the plane. 
So as a 25-year-old, I kind of define my success as someone labelling me something as a, as a doctor or getting a, um, a, a qualification. And I underestimated how hard it would be to do a doctorate, by the way. Um, but alongside uh, working as an assistant lecturer, I did my doctorate part-time in five years and then sort of fell into lecturing. So I started lecturing um, in the management department at the University of Otago and then moved into the Master of Entrepreneurship program where I had a call one day from uh, Brendan Gray, who you'll hear from later, who said, have I got a deal for you? Come and work with me uh, as the chair of DCC Chair of Entrepreneurship. So I took a secondment and worked with Brendan on the Master of Entrepreneurship program, which was really innovative, um, an amazing um, program which produces a lot of really, really uh, clever entrepreneurs who are doing really well um, in New Zealand and around the world. So that was, that was neat. Um, then I came here and I had a similar kind of conversation around um, would I come in and lead the Doctor of Professional Practice, which at that time uh, was um, approved by, uh, I think Sam had spent a lot of time working on um, the approval process and said it was all ready to go and we could get underway. So that was pretty exciting because it was a new program, first doctorate for Otago Polytech. So I did that for four years and I have now um, have that in the, in the hands of our co-leader Helen and Johnny who look after that program. So I kind of found myself in a bit of a special specialisation, I suppose, around um, postgraduate um, learners, supervision, and that's really kind of where I, um, where, where I, I suppose, enjoy the most and where, I, uh, where my day job keeps me today. So hopefully some of my learners will be listening online. Um, so that's the, the kind of, uh, I guess, the, the short story. And I'm going to come back to this at the end and tell you the actual story, right? Um, once, once we get through, through this presentation. <laughs> So, um, tall poppy syndrome, so what is it, uh, just to start off with? So it's usually a person who has some sort of success or talent or status, and tall poppy syndrome is where people tend to want to knock uh, the, that person, um, or resent them, begrudge them, mock them, or somehow sort of bring them down. So you'll see the image there of the poppies. Often we see tall poppy syndrome with a cut through the middle of those beautiful poppies to try and uh, knock people down. Um, it's, it's a bit tricky as to where it came from um, and how widespread it, tall poppy syndrome is and whether it's a, a New Zealand phenomenon only. So we, we're seeing it quite often coming up now in um, Australasia, Australia as well, and other countries in the Nordic areas. Um, have a, a very similar thing called Janta, or in Germany, uh, Schandenfreude, where there's um, joy basically placed on people's um, down, if people have a downfall. So it started off being recognised sort of in the academic literature around the 80s, where a psychologist started um, actually asking his students what people thought of a hypothetical scenario of someone failing. So, for example, um, you know, Jo was a, a, a lecturer and she got fired because she stole a pen. Um, or, you know, so-and-so was an all-black and they um, got injured and so their career was over. So a lot of it relates to the, the reason for the fall. So if I stole a pen and I got fired, I'm going to have um, reason for, a, for my fall and people are going to blame me and so they're going to think of me, you know, in a more harsh way. But the person who's got injured, if they're a sporting person, for example, and they've um, somehow failed, they're going to be seen a little bit better because people will be kinder to them because it was some sort of accident. So Feather is um, the psychologist who was started to talk about this. Um, he really only got to sort of talking with students um, and asking around these hypo hypothetical examples and then there were a few sort of things that, that came up now and again but it, it's not really a, re a well researched area with a lot of theory or, or models or anything like that. So how did I come into this? Um, quite by accident actually. So when I did my PhD I was asking around um, entrepreneurs about why they started their business and quite a few started saying well it's, it's, it's all good but except for this tall poppy syndrome thing and I said what, what on earth is that? 
It was something I'd never heard of at all. And um, I started then incorporating this into my, my interviews and asking about people, how people perceive them. And they started telling some really horrible stories, actually, about what, what they had experienced as being entrepreneurs. So if we look at what Feather says, these people are entrepreneurs. They've put a lot of effort in. They've got ability there. They've put in quite often a, a lot of risk, taken a lot of risk. They've put their, you know, um, they've remortgaged their house or they've put a lot of investment in it. In. But people didn't seem to see that entrepreneurs were had got there through hard work and effort and ability, whereas they would see that if it was a sports person, for example. So I thought this is really odd. And people started talking about how they would get their cars damaged, or people would assume that because they were an entrepreneur that they must be really, really rich. And they would people would say things to them, like for example, their staff and their customers, um, and then general public. And the customers would say, well, you know, if you're driving that, um, fancy car, then you must be charging me too much. So people would be hiding the vehicles that they had because they couldn't drive them because you couldn't take it to work because what would people think? So I thought that was a, kind of really sad that people had put in a lot of, um, spent a lot of time and effort to become an entrepreneur and then they experienced this. So then I thought I need to really look into this a little bit further. Um, and it became quite popular in that people wanted to hear about it, so I started talking uh, to in the media about it and writing articles about it. And I did my first uh, debut on breakfast TV where apparently I did not blink for three minutes. <laughs> and, um, and I was even featured in Hot Rod magazine. Um, so it sort of seemed to be quite a, a broad thing, not just perhaps entrepreneurs. Um, I then went and did some more research with the late uh, Lorraine Warren around celebrity entrepreneurs and found similar things to, to this. So very much um, that wasn't really perceived in a positive way and there was a lot of impact. Um, so who, who does it impact? Uh, sports people are an interesting case because it tends to be people see that they've put an effort, they see ability and they're okay with that generally. So the All Blacks are a good example where we can see that there's been effort and ability, and also there's a, a, a sort of culture around the All Blacks of being very humble about, uh, about things. And I think recently we're seeing this maybe turning a little bit, where the negative press and people on social media and talking about some of the recent losses, um, you know, they were so, so successful for so long, I guess, and now suddenly it's really turned. And I've noticed that um, in the last couple of weeks, people seem to be getting a bit more personal, a bit more perhaps vicious um, around it. Um, mixed martial art artist Israel Adesanya, he was talking quite a bit about tall poppy syndrome and saying, you know, that's really impacting him in terms of his um, career as an athlete and that he was looking to move away um, because of it. And uh, we've also seen it in the creative industry, so um, actors saying they've moved away because they they don't um, you know don't want to be here because of it. So it seemed like you know there's people leaving because of this, uh, or partly because of it. And recently, in the last week or so, we we've seen Sir Ray Avery saying that he's going to leave the country because of this and a few other things as well, um, and that he thinks that going to Australia will be better for him. Um, yeah, and so we've also seen Lani Fogelberg in the media this year um, because she had a Ferrari. She bought a Ferrari and she um, drives the Ferrari around. <laughs> and people don't like that. So there's a lot of comments um, around, around her having, having um, a fancy car. And we're also seeing it in the workplace, which I think there's a, a link there to bullying as well, which I think is something interesting that I quite like to look at down the track is how, how close this tall poppy syndrome is to bullying. So why, why are we still, talk, still talking about this? Um, at the end of last year, um, or actually since COVID started as well, but it, it, my interest kind of renewed in this area because there was a young entrepreneur who died by suicide um, last year and there was a lot of commentary at the time around on social media and in the media around um, you know that he was driven to this uh, 
death because he was a tall poppy and that um, there's a lot of blame in terms of the media were, were at fault and social media. Um, so that kind of raised it again and it, it, it cropped up again and started appearing. And I thought, wow, this is, um, why are we still talking about this? I thought it had disappeared, but no. And around the same time as well, we were going through, or still are, going through COVID and we keep getting this message to say, be kind. We must be kind to each other. And funnily enough, I was going through my photos the other day on my phone and I found a picture of a teddy bear that I had stuck in the window in that very first lockdown when we baked banana bread and put, went on walks and put teddy bears in the window. And then I think down the track things became <laughs> quite divided and while there was this be kind messaging, there was also people who were um, not allowed back in the country, Beth included actually. Um, and so then some divisions sort of started coming and it, a lot of people thought that that could be possibly tall poppy syndrome where it was sort of a them and an us type of situation. Um, and as time has gone on, it seems like we're being less kind to each other. Um, and so these kind of things combined and Rod and I thought, hang on, is this just happening to entrepreneurs or is this just like small pockets of things that crop up in the media or is this happening to other people? And could we find out how it's impacting them? So we did a small survey, um, which I'm going to talk to you about now. So we sent off a survey via our social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and through some of the Auckland University um, groups that, alumni groups and Centre for Entrepreneurship groups. And we got back 297 um, responses. Um, and yeah, I'll just tell you a wee bit about what we found and then I'll talk more about the impact that it had had on them. So we found that 90% uh, of people believed that tall poppy syndrome existed and that's not to be unexpected because people are gonna fill in a survey about tall poppy syndrome because they're interested in that. And so it's, it's not, um, you know, while it's quite high, it's, it's probably not representative of how, um, you know, how many people are impacted. But the most of those people felt like they had been impacted by tall poppy syndrome. So about 215 of them felt like they were being impacted. So if you have a look here, we can see that the professional success and education success are the main ones. And right at the bottom, we've got these sporting people. So this sort of backs up what we'd, what we'd seen before, where sporting success is actually pretty okay. Um, being in the media even is okay and, and receiving awards, but professional success, which I guess this sort of thing here, we're, why we're here for today, and educational success were seen to be um, reasons as to why people felt like they'd been um, labelled, I guess, a tall poppy. And then we asked them how it was experienced. And this was a bit of a surprise to us because we kind of expected just, again, based on, I guess, what we were seeing in the news and social media, that social media might be higher up, but it's actually face-to-face, in-person um, conversations. So initially we were thinking, wow, it's, that's not good. Um, it's people that you know. And then we started thinking, well, hang on a minute. If it's people that you know, then maybe you can address it. You can talk to these people. You can do something about it. So good and bad there. And you can see there there's another category, and this was um, people who were um, experienced it because they were doing something different. They felt like they were doing something outside of the norm, and so they were experiencing um, tall poppy syndrome. And then where was it coming from? It was coming from people quite close. Our colleagues were the first people, and again, that was a bit of a surprise. I think we thought that it was more strangers, it was more the keyboard warriors who were out there um, just commenting, or, but it was actually colleagues. And, and then when you look down, friends and um, family and whanau as well. So that was a bit of a, um, a surprise. But again, let's turn that around and go, well, if it's your colleagues, maybe there's something that you can do about that. Um, so that gave us a sort of sense of where it was coming from, but we were most interested in listening or um, asking people what the impact was on them. So we got 650 um, open-ended answers to um, questions around the impact, and this is not good reading at all. Um, quite upsetting, actually. 
So first we asked them what the impact on them professionally was, and this was not good. So the, um, even though we asked about professional impact, the emotional impact came out first. So people were feeling that this was really impacting their, um, their mental health, their mental well-being, and you can have a look at some of the quotes there on the side that they, you know, people were just saying they're defeated. They're, there were people saying they were, it was um, causing depression, anxiety, suicidal even. They were just really, I guess, at the end of their tether in terms of the impact that this was having. And so thinking about what other things um, impacted them was they sort of decided to kind of disengage a little bit. And you can imagine if you're dealing with some of these um, people sort of trying to knock you down that, well, why wouldn't you disengage? You would, do you want to kind of offer your help as a mentor or help, help others um, on their journey if you're going to get knocked? So you go, no, I'm just going to disengage and go under the radar. So that was something we had found in our entrepreneurship study as well, is that people disengaged. So these people were just taking themselves out of, out of um, the limelight, I suppose. And people also had impact in terms of lost opportunities, so lost jobs, people felt like they had lost jobs because of it, lost um, business opportunities, and so there were some that had actually had quite a lot of financial impact um, from this. And then others would just stay quiet and not share their successes, so again that was quite, some of those stories there were quite devastating because they felt like they couldn't say if they'd won an award, for example, so that, that's not good. Um, but there were others who said, let's just accept that this is part of our life here and we should just get on with it. And we should just say, actually, I'm going to call you out and say this is tall poppy syndrome. Um, let's, let's talk about it. So yeah, there was sort of a, a mixed bag there. But of the 200 and so, or so comments here, we had, it was just quite upsetting. Um, and I didn't think it would probably be quite as um, serious as this. I didn't expect that we would see death threats and suicidal thinking. Um, so I think it's, it's something that really makes me want to continue this work because it's having an impact on people. And I think we need to, we need to keep, keep trying to find out if this is, again, it's, if it's really um, a targeted small group of people or uh, is, it, is this happening more widely. So when we asked about the personal impact, the same thing came up, really. Um, people ask, talking about the, this, this emotional impact that it had, had on them. Um, and again, stepping back and disengaging. So we lose these people from being, being tall poppies and helping others. So I think it's a real, a real problem. Um, and, and again, these people here, some of them also had health implications. So. Um, some people said they had PTSD from this. Um, others had, yeah, had felt like this is impacting their health, um, their physical health as well as their mental health. And again, others here said, um, we just got to accept it. So then we asked um, about whether people felt like there was um, tall poppy syndrome was having an impact on New Zealand, and. Mm, yes, the answer was. <laughs> People did think it was having an impact. Um, that it was really holding us back. And that's, I guess, the, the title of my presentation here is, is it holding us back? And the answers that we got from our participants, I think, definitely suggest that, yes, it could be holding us back. So there was a sense that there was an overriding sort of negative perception of success. So if you have a look there at that second comment, comment um, which is a quote from one of the participants, that if you were successful, that that's somehow confused with wealth. So not all success needs to be um, necessarily wealthy. Um, and I think some of the reasons or definitions of success, which we'll talk about in a minute, might, might need to be re revisited. And then we had a lot of people talking about it holding them back. So um, they're deliberately kind of holding back their own ambition and potential because of this. So again, related to the previous slide, if you were sort of disengaging, um, that you think, well, if I'm going to get that, why would I bother? Why try to reach higher if I'm just going to become sort of above the parapet and I'm going to get knocked down by people? 
So people just said that they felt like they just um, lost their confidence in terms of wanting to be um, have high ambitions. So I think that's also a real, real loss um, to us as a country. And others said it stifled their innovation and creativity. So again, they were thinking, well, I'm not getting much reception for innovative ideas here, despite how entrepreneurial and innovative New Zealand is. So I'll go away, go overseas. Um, or just feel like there was not, a, um, people weren't receptive to change or new thinking. And then we had a lot of other people talking about being fearful, fearful um, their failure, that failure was also looked, looked upon you know, really badly. And also what worries me um, about one of them, one of the main thing that worries me is the loss of role models. So if you don't, if you've disengaged and you don't want to be that role model, then what about the people coming behind you? Um, and Beth mentioned it in her introduction. I think that's a really important thing to, to bring others uh, along with you. So if you're disengaged because you feel like you've been cut down, then there's a huge loss, I think, as, as we, um, to bring on new people. And the brain drain. So there were people who said they were packing up and going um, because of this. And again, I don't think we could argue that this is the only reason, but it was certainly impacting their thinking of moving overseas because they might get a better um, reception there in terms of people um, being okay with ambition and success a little bit more. And people spoke about division, a division in society um, and a lot. I think some also talked there about COVID and how that had impacted and how that had also sort of created some division which um, was having, having some issues. And there was also there again that the emotional impact came out. Um, and what we found also was an interesting thing where it wasn't just the person um, answering who was the tall poppy. We found a, a new thing, I think, which is interesting. Um, we're calling it tall poppy by proxy, where people had had gifted children. There was quite a few pe uh, people who answered this who had gifted children. And they felt like they were tall poppies because their children, they were being knocked, I guess, um, because their children were the tall poppies. So it was quite interesting and it relates to sort of what can we do about it and education being really, really important. Yeah, so I think some of the quotes here, it's really holding people back because they're worried about the social stigma. That's um, not good. And again, that mentality of success equals rich and, you know, not, a, not everyone's... Um, yeah, necessarily rich, but I think the nation of we're a nation of innovators, but when we're, our innovations are stifled by envious, mean-spirited people who resent change, we can only advance with difficulty. So there's quite a bit of talk about you know having these great ideas, but really being sort of stuck in terms of being able to move forward with them. So again, I think it's it's difficult. Um, so yeah, I do think it's, it's, it is holding us back. We don't know, again, how widespread this might be. It's a small survey, and we've only captured you know, 300 views, but I think um, by, by many of the comments, the impact is um, big. And so I think we wanna carry on understanding sort of what we can do. So that's the next step. We asked our participants to tell us what, what we've, they thought could be done about this. And the key one that came up primarily was we need to change the society, and you know that's a big, a big ask. Um, so fostering more collective and inclusive culture that celebrates people for who they are, um, and education being the key. So um, right from when children are young, to teach them that success is okay, to celebrate all types of success, and not just that, that that's on the sporting field or musical, but um, academic success, for example, or professional success, or all kinds of um, different success. So the bottom quote there, you can see um, someone is saying, you know, we should recognise and support academic and intellectual as much as we um, do for sports and performing arts, and that people um, must, that sort of success must be acceptable. Yeah, so all types of success came up quite a bit, um, where people felt like there were certain types of success that were okay and certain types that weren't. And there's also a small set of people who thought the media were having a play here, and I think this is probably lower than what I was expecting, that um, 
I think because we hear a lot about this in the media, I sort of wonder about whether there's anything that they could do. But there was quite a, a, a few, very small amount of people actually who thought that maybe the media could showcase more positive role, um, role models in terms of show the journey as to how they got to where they got and not just show them with the, the fancy car or the, the sort of, you know, I've got to the top, but talk more about the journey, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, yeah, and again, calling it out. So let's just say, this is, this is tall poppy syndrome. So then I thought, what can you do? Um, so we have all this information and it's really concerning and I thought, we can't not do anything with it. We need to, rather than just writing up academic articles about it, we need to try and do something about this. So I initially thought, let's put together a working group and we'll talk about it. And then I thought, yeah, maybe we're just going to you know, keep talking about it. So I started to think about what you could do as an individual um, based on our findings here. And I think one thing we can do is talk openly about what success is to people um, and how we define success differently. Um, so I defined success when I was 24 to be called doctor, and that is not how I define success right now. Uh, so to talk um, about your your journey. And most people's journeys aren't, you know, kind of linear like this, and there's usually been um, some bumps along the way and things to learn. Um, and I also thought about growing, uh, what I call growing a success pie. So because I'm successful doesn't mean that the next person can't be. So there's not a limit on how many people can be successful, particularly I think if we define success in our own way. So what success means to me, is different to Brendan, and so we can probably both be successful if, if we have different definitions. I mean, there are some cases where if you want to be Prime Minister, there's only a few of those, and maybe you're pretty limited. But, but if we think about what success means to you, and try and think about um, you know, more people being able to be successful, and part of that is putting um, success on people's agendas, and we're doing that at work actually, and Liz, um, our head of college, who's here, uh, started putting this as a standing item on our agenda with our team meetings to talk about success. So it might be success at work or home um, or a personal success, but just to keep that on people's agendas and, and radar to talk about it every time, no matter how big or small it is. And I think that's really important to keep talking about it. Um, I think, as I said, I think it's really important to help others on their success journey. Um, for a while there, in the last year or so, around the Great Resignation, I have been what I call the reference queen, where a lot of people have been looking to move jobs, and so I always support people who, um, in terms of providing them with references or helping them along their way um, into their own success journey, because I don't subscribe to the idea that if they're successful, that means I can't be. So again, sort of the pie, thinking about we grow the whole pie, we can we can all have our own version of success. And finally, I think a lot of, in the previous slide, we talked about um, education as being key and that you know teachers could help and the whole education system was, was not good because it was teaching children to, be, to participate but not to think of success. Um, but we probably can't necessarily change the whole education system personally, um, but we can teach our own children um, to encourage and celebrate their own successes, which are all going to be um, different, depending on the child. So that's a bit of a summary of where we're at. And Rod and I are currently uh, working alongside our research assistant, Kirsty, um, to look at a, a greater depth of what literature has been, um, has, has come in the last couple of years, and there has been a little bit more. So we're looking um, at that at the moment, and then we're going to try and see whether we can um, look at how doing a, a wider survey about how widespread this is and getting a bit more detail. This is a pretty um, short and snappy survey, but it getting a bit more detail and also doing a, a bit more in the way of qualitative interviews as well to understand more, and I think um, to understand how those connections with things like bullying um, are, you know, how, how, how this is sort of different or is it not? Um, so, yeah, so now I'm going to circle back to the beginning and tell you a wee bit about my success journey, which 
when I talked about at the beginning was quite linear and I just sort of went on this trajectory and I got here. But I think we're really when, if you want to be honest about it, my success uh, journey had a lot more in it than um, all good things. So I think we should acknowledge that and um, that that's part of my story and there's been stress and and I think Beth spoke about some of this here, about the overwork. Um, I have a tendency that way, I'm that way inclined. Got to really pull back and stop that. Um, my definition of success now, nowadays, I guess, is to have good work-family balance. So I work part-time and, and try and um, you know, balance, balance my work with my family. Um, I've had periods of being called the difficult woman and um, purely because apparently it seemed like I was young, a young new academic woman who had an opinion. Um, I've had imposter syndrome like many people have. We think I'm, I don't deserve this somehow. But on the other hand, I've had a lot of opportunities. I've had lots of challenging work, lots of really stimulating work, people believing in me and, um, you know, being able to to make a difference. Um, a lot of friendship and support for people who are in the room and online. So yeah, I think this is, this is how I think we need to talk about success a little bit more, that if we, if we looked at uh, Prime Minister, or for example, or our top sports people, that if the story was told, which is much more of a realistic sort of story rather than picking out the good bits, that people might relate to that a little bit more and, and think, hmm, okay. I might be able to do some of that <laughs> or learn something, um, you know, from it. So, yes, there's been some some good and some bad, and um, so I'm going to leave it there. And if you're online, you can send through some a text or a, an email, and we're just going to finish here. And so there'll be a few minutes if you want to um, just send those through. So we'll pick them up now and then. Well, good. So I'll hand you over to Brendan. Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> Great. Tanakre Ahorangi Joe Kirkwood, Namiki Hui, Namai Hari Mai. Thank you, Professor Jay Kirkwood, for that uh, interesting and inspiring korero. Uh, it is now my honour and great pleasure to give the fai korero, or closing remarks, for your inaugural professorial lecture. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm Brendan Gray, and I'm an Emeritus Professor of Marketing at the University of Otago, and I was also the University's inaugural Professor of Entrepreneurship. Um, if it's not already obvious to those of you who've had the pleasure of listening to Professor Kirkwood uh, this evening, then let me reiterate, Jo is an amazing person. Mother, wife, teacher, supervisor, researcher, journal editor, and volunteer. And a friend to many, and she does everything so well that it's sometimes easy to forget the huge amounts of time and thought and energy she puts into these different roles. And she's committed to all of them. And some of us who've uh, worked with her and had real deals for her have been guilty of giving her too much. <laughs> and uh, because she's so capable, Jo will just take on more and more and more. And uh, sometimes we forget that even, even really tall poppies like Jo can get broken. <laughs> and uh, so that's a, that's a lesson for us too, uh, particularly uh, those of us who are in managerial sorts of posi positions too is to not to take for granted the really capable people we have and, and, and overwork them. Um, but Joe is truly an inspiration to many people, uh, including the large numbers of undergraduate and postgraduate students that she's taught, supervised and mentored. Now I've known, known liked and respected Joe for quite a few years now, uh, including our time working together at the Centre for Entrepreneurship at the University of Otago. Um, as uh, mentioned by uh, Beth, uh, we've co-authored several journal articles and one of them recently uh, won an international award. And um, Jo is now a senior editor herself of a respected international publication, a small enterprise research journal. 
Um, also along the way, when Jo was working with us at the Centre for Entrepreneurship, she pulled together an awful lot of research about what the inputs were into our program and also what the outputs were, and then put all that to get packaged that all together and entered that into an international teaching competition, and we won. And uh, we would never have got there if it weren't for Jo actually taking the initiative to, to actually do that. And we managed to use that information a few years later uh, when the program was reviewed, it was going through its five-year review, and uh, uh, all we needed to do was just pull the, uh, really, the entry form that Joe had filled <laughs> and just expand on that. The information was there, she'd done the research, um, she had the evidence, and, uh, and that was really, really, really useful. Um, so, um, Jo really is a tall poppy herself in, in a number of areas, but uh, particularly in the fields of sustainable, environmental, family and gender related entrepreneurship research. And I know that her students, colleagues and managers at Targo Polytechnic appreciate the bright flower that uh, they have nurtured. And so they certainly don't want to cut her down now. Her uh, journal articles and conference papers um, have been cited nearly 3,000 times by other authors in their own research publications. So that gives you an indication of the respect that jo Joe has earned in the eyes of other business uh, researchers. Her most cited articles include studies into the different motivations of men and women to become entrepreneurs, how entrepreneurs balance work and family commitments, how parents encourage children to become entrepreneurs, what motivates people to start green ventures, and of course the causes and effects of the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, without a doubt, too, Jo is a, a people person, and I, I think that's come across through from her presentation and also the kind words that uh, that, that preceded uh, that presentation. Um, and it's clearly evident in the good relationships that she has uh, with family, friends, students, colleagues, and and also uh, people in industry as well. But that that ha that people person approach has a, a positive spillover into much of her research as well. So, for example, a common theme in many of her studies is how interpersonal relationships can affect the ways um, that people start, manage, and grow new enterprises. The results of her research are applicable at many levels, local, national, and international, and they provide good lessons for economic development agencies who wish to encourage more people to start and develop sustainable enterprises. Her research is also of value to social, environmental and commercial business owners who are keen to gain insights in how to balance their work and life commitments. Uh, jo goes to great lengths to ensure that the results of her various studies are communicated to those who could benefit from them, they could learn from them, maybe they could enact uh, some of these uh, lessons. So for example, many of the journals that she publishes in, along with the one that she edits, are read by practitioners as well as by researchers and by students. And she often publicizes the results of her studies in local and national news media outlets as well as in industry publications. I didn't realize though until she spoke earlier that, um, that the Hot Rod magazine was one of them. <laughs> so for example, she was recently interviewed by the Otago Daily Times business editor Sally Ray about the results of this latest Tall Poppies survey and that got um, that got quite a, quite a big mention as well. And of course that was picked up by other media as well as a result of that. So in summary then, I think Joe has clearly demonstrated that she is worthy of the title of Ahorang or Professor. So well done, Professor Joe Cooper. Thank you. I'm not really gonna make a speech, but I am gonna say congratulations, Joe. That was a really thought provoking presentation and really honest and open modelling what you think part of the answer is. So that's brave and we really appreciate you doing that. Yeah. So here's something for you to commemorate and remember us for a day or two anyway, this occasion, and a hug please. Okay, well done. And maybe a round of applause to finish. Thank you so much, Joe.
ke ino e tātou. Unu hia, unu hia. Unu hia ki tūru tapanu ki a wātea, ki a māma te nākau, te tīnana te wairua tāra takatū. Koi ara e roko whakakiri, whakari ake ki runga ki a tīna, tīna. Hui e taiki e. Ngā mihi whānau.